hello, good evening, and welcome, as David Frost used to say. Um, you'll notice that my speech has just been arriving. The, the last time I was at a place where the speaker didn't have a speech, the speaker was Nelson Mandela, no less. So I guess I'm in moderately good company. Um, and he suddenly got up onto the platform and said, where is my speech? And five felt their pockets like this, and then pointed to the next guy, and each one, each one did it. And eventually, the last one put his hands up. Uh, and uh, anyway, they sent him, he, he did Q&A while they went to the hotel to get his speech. And then they came back with the speech, and he said, where are my glasses? <laughs> and again, the same thing, hands, pockets, and then pointed to the next one, did the same thing, etc. Eventually, Winnie, who was sitting next to me, I was the number two person in the organisation, so I had to look after the second most important guest, who was Winnie. Um, that was interesting. Uh, uh, Winnie, give me yours. And so he delivered this speech wearing Edna Everidge star glasses <laughs> and did it with complete lack of self-consciousness. And although he was still in his communist phase, he managed completely to wow some really hard-bitten industrialists so I think uh, it just shows that if you've got a certain type of personality and charm, you can win in almost any circumstances, even giving a speech in Edna Everidge star glasses. Now, let me come to this. We're now getting to the closing laps of my Gresham professorship, um, and I'm starting to pull the threads together in the last three lectures of this series. I'm setting down at the end of the current academic year because of the pressure of work. It's actually quite serious if you... Quite difficult if you've got a serious day job and are not a professional academic, and obviously the latter precludes the former, to put in the hours that you need uh, to provide seven decent Gresham professorial lectures a year. The final lecture uh, on the relative economic strength of the UK and Australian economies and on whether that is the cause of relative performance in the Ashes series was intended to be a bit of light relief but given the results this winter, I'm not sure that that any longer would be an appropriate phrase, although the England ladies seem to be doing rather better than the men. Um, I did say at the start of the academic year that the improving UK economy and the deteriorating Aussie economy might mean that we were in for a bit of a surprise, but even I wasn't suggesting 5 nil. I also want, keeping up the theme of cricket in this last lecture, to try and... Uh, develop some musings about whether it's actually possible to have democracy if you don't play cricket. Now, that's a very serious subject, which I will try and weave into a slightly more light-hearted one. Uh, so we'll see how we can do it and avoid um, uh, 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 too much papering over the cracks. Now, today's lecture shows how the UK will have to rely much more than hitherto on trade to make the books balance in this new world where the bulk of the world economy has industrialised rather than just 8% of the world's population. And by comparison, consumer spending, especially when measured in volume terms, will become a, gradually a smaller part of the economy. This lecture was very nearly given on a ship. and In fact, the ship is actually there, moored in the Pool of London at the moment as we speak. But uh, the... Uh, slowness with which the Navy diverted the ship from the rather less serious cause of patrolling the Straits of Hormuz to the rather more serious cause of being uh, the appropriate uh, venue for our lecture meant that they couldn't arrange it in time, which is a great pity because the ship, the ship is actually there. Uh, but the Royal Navy have actually supported part of the work that's incorporated in this lecture. <laughs> And part of the talk is based not just on the work I've done for the Royal Navy, but also on the address I gave to the NATO Supreme Maritime Commanders meeting in London a couple of months ago on the outlook for world trade and its impact on the requirements for naval protection. Incidentally, I sometimes get a little bit satirical about uh, Valerie's uh, uh, toughness in making sure the lectures end in time. If you speak to NATO, uh, the guy who's trying to stop you from over speaking, overdoing your time. His day job is running a boat with nuclear weapons. So, uh, you know, if he says stop, you stop. Um, let me go through what we're going to say. 
first of all, I'm going to talk about how the emerging economies affect economic structure through their impacts in terms of trade. I'm then going to divert a bit into the changing shape of the world economy with our latest World Economic League table, which got released on Boxing Day. And finally, I'll come back to the UK in more detail and show what it looks. I started the lecture series with a comparison with other major economic changes, the so-called discovery of the Americas, the Industrial Revolution, the emergence of Japan, and the emergence of offshore manufacturing in Southeast Asia, and showed that the two characteristics of this latest phase were the combination of scale and speed. And because it's happening so quickly, it's moved ahead of changes in attitude. And so you've got countries which, in practical terms, are rich, but still have a lot of the behaviour and political uh, structures that they had when they were poor. Uh, and, of course, there are people around who either can remember poverty directly or have, were brought up with parents who you know, were on the brink of starvation. And that obviously affects your attitude to things. And in a sense, because these emerging economies have emerged so rapidly, whereas we've got a bit soft, we've uh, become uh, less aggressive about our pursuit of free markets, red and tooth and claw, uh, they tend to be much more aggressive. They have lower levels of government spending, they tend not to have welfare, um, and they work pretty damn hard. The Singaporeans and the Hong Kongies who have actually got rich still work the equivalent of four months more each year than we do. Most of them, it's normal to work on Saturdays. We've rather given that up in, in the UK. Um, also, they keep government spending down and hence taxation. The top rate of tax in Hong Kong is 15%. That's the top rate. They have lower rates as well. And by the way, they still have a health system that creates greater longevity. People in Hong Kong live longer than any, anyone anywhere else in the world. They still have a fantastic education system, at least as measured by the PISA tables, the international comparison. And of course, they've got much better infrastructure than we have. Now, if we assume that China and the other emerging countries are going the same way, then their effects are going to be extremely disruptive. There are five big shifts, which are the shift from west to east, which is pretty, pretty obvious. The shift from labour to capital, which I dealt with um, a couple of lectures ago. Um, the impact on savings, which was in the fifth lecture, the one in February 2013. Um, the effect on the distribution of income, skilled, unskilled, which was the first lecture of the current academic year in September. And the impact on primary products. Now, that we covered in the second lecture, where I felt that I didn't really have enough expertise myself. So I got my brother to help me. Um, he's director of uh, renewable energy for the engineering consultants, Mott McDonald, and Thras Moraitis, who is the commercial director, was then the commercial director of Extrata, uh, and is now engaged in rather interesting things, which I suspect are going to make him horribly rich. Uh, good luck to him. And what this showed was that if we had world economic growth at roughly the same rate as we've had in the past, then that would cause, on average, the price of energy and primary products to rise, but within a sort of manageable extent. If we had much faster growth, then um, it was likely that uh, the shortages of primary resources and energy would put so much upward pressure on inflation that the growth would be squeezed out. And from that, we concluded that that meant if world growth was going to be the same, but the emerging economies were going to have to take a bigger share of it, that meant we would have to take a smaller share. And part of what we're discussing today is how we squeeze out that smaller share and what the implications are for us. Um, we concluded that the impact would affect the terms of trade. That's the ratio of import prices to export prices. Um, clearly, the higher prices of primary products directly affect the terms of trade through pushing up import prices. But in addition to this, the super competitive nature of the emerging economies means that we will probably have to devalue in real terms to export enough. And that also has an impact 
uh, on the terms of trade. So if you put all those things together, we will devalue in real terms either through a lower nominal exchange rate or else by having lower inflation than the emerging economies, and either of these will worsen the terms of trade. Obviously, this is much more against the currencies of the emerging economies than, for example, the euro. Uh, probably we will devalue against most important countries, but still not against our European brethren in, in the euro, where, I mean, some of the economies are so bad that, for example, the French president has been forced to get a new mistress to distract attention from the weakness of the economy. When I learnt my economics in the 1960s, and I'm sorry to show you how old I am, uh, the news was dominated by the balance of payments current account. Indeed, it's rumoured that Harold Wilson, and some of you may remember him, uh, lost the 1970 uh, election because of the erratic balance of payment statistics that emerged just before that election. Mind you, it's also rumoured that he lost that election because of the England defeat in the Soccer World Cup. Uh, just four days before the election, which was bad planning. At least that story is a bit more plausible than the claim that's often made that Harold Wilson won the 1966 general election because of England's victory in that year's World Cup, despite the fact that the victory happened a full 17 weeks after the general election. Um, however, people can quite easily misremember history. But those is studied economics in the 1960s and 1970s were exposed to a very detailed analysis of the impact of the balance of payments. This is because under the Bretton Woods arrangement of fixed exchange rates, devaluations were a political and economic defeat. And because governments tried to avoid them, speculation against currencies caused by balance of payments problems tended to be resisted by attempts, against de uh, attempts at deflation, which affected people's spending power or public services. And there are some similarities with the current situation in the Eurozone. During the period of flexible exchange rates that we've had for most of the past 40 years, discussion of the balance of payments has been de-emphasised. This is for two reasons. First, exchange rates have been flexible and have been able to adjust to accommodate balance of payments imbalances. And secondly, international capital flows have been on such a scale that they have dominated uh, the balance of payments current account imbalances. But as I pointed out in my November uh, 2012 lecture, the scale of adjustment posed by the super competitiveness of the emerging economies is such that the devaluations that would be required fully to correct balance of payments imbalances are likely to be non-marginal and may not be manageable within a reasonable inflation constraint. So we may be back to a world where balance of payments problems limit your growth. In addition, although the depth of international capital markets certainly alters the time period over which the balance of payments must balance, it's hard to see why the international markets would forever keep shifting their portfolio preferences in favour of holding increasing proportions of a deficit currency like sterling. There might be some ability for a reserve currency like the dollar to break the rule, since in the end it's the base of the system. But when there are multiple potential reserve currencies, the dollar, the euro, and increasingly the renminbi, for example, um, investors have a choice. And it's hard to see why they should want to hold increasing proportions of their assets in a currency which all the laws of economic gravity say will ultimately not just lose value, but lose value on the scale that will greatly offset any interest rate differential. So the changing nature of the world economy means that the balance of payments current account, and more precisely the current account plus the long-term capital accounts in countries with high rates of persistent inward investment, might need to run current account deficits for the physical imports necessary to match this inward investment. But the current account plus the long-term capital account must balance in the long term. And that long term has probably, having lengthened for the last 40 years, has probably got shorter again uh, to something more like a five-year horizon from about a 15-year horizon at its peak. Let me now turn to the economic prospects. Um, every year on Boxing Day, we publish something called the World Economic League Table, uh, which we call Die Welt, 
after The Economist, you started it, Tim Ellenberg, although we have to call that fairly surreptitiously, as I said in my interview with De Spiegel, because we do realise that if we uh, use that name too, on too widespread a basis, uh, we would end up being sued. And what we do is give a scoreline for world GDP in dollar terms by countries for the year that's just ending, so we call the result of the match about two minutes early. Um, and then we forecast up to 15 years ahead. We use current dollar GDP, which is not the only way of making comparisons, um, because it's less ambiguous. There are a whole series of different ways of making purchasing power ca parity calculations, and uh, they rely on rather more assumptions than I feel comfortable with. Obviously, it's the forecast we have to make assumptions. We have to look at three things. First of all, the growth of real GDP. Secondly, relative inflation. And third, the movement of exchange rates. The first two are relatively easy to predict by economist standards. It doesn't mean we'll get it right, but uh, the scale of error tends to be within a band. But exchange rates seem to have an almost sort of death wish. They, 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 they seem to want to defy any economist's predictions. I don't know anyone who's particularly good at forecasting exchange rates. I'm certainly not, and I reckon if any economist was going to be reasonably good, it'd be likely to be me. Um, but uh, I can't do it, and I can't see how anyone else would, and in fact the practice shows they can't. But what it does mean is because we have to change our exchange rate forecast every year, we have to revise the World League table every year, which means you have to buy the latest edition. So it has some value for us, uh, even if it comes from the wrong, the wrong source. So, I mean, these league tables are not to be taken entirely seriously, but what they do do is they do slightly encourage governments to try and follow policies which are sort of good for promoting economic growth, which is the main thing that they've got under their control, um, rather than making gestures that may be quite populist to, uh, but are not good for the economy. And hopefully they sort of point them in the right direction. That's about as far as we go. Now, the leak table for 2012, which is up here on the slide, showed the developed countries still doing pretty well. The, UK is in, the US is in the lead, with a GDP about twice that of China. The UK had overtaken Brazil again, having just got behind in 2011. Um, yeah. For 2013, the big news has been the collapse of some of the emerging market economies um, in response to the threats and at the end of the year the actuality of tapering of monetary policy in the United States. There have been some minor movements in the top half of the table. Russia, Russia gets ahead of Italy in response to the Italian economic travails. Um, Canada overtakes India because of the collapse of the rupee. But lower down, there's some bigger movements. The collapse of the rant means that South Africa leaves the table altogether, while Iran had dropped nine places as economic sanctions bite. For 2018, of course, we're moving here to forecast. We do start to see the European economies fall back in the league table. Our forecast is that the euro will weaken against both the dollar and the sterling, more against the dollar, as interest rates rise in both the US and in the UK over this period, while they go nowhere in the eurozone. So this in turn means that the UK goes decisively ahead of France, so the poor French president may find he needs another girlfriend, um, while other European uh, economies slip down the table. Meanwhile, the commodity economies and emerging economies start to move up. Brazil gets up to a high point of 6th, India 9th, Mexico 12th, Korea 13th, and Turkey 17th. And Thailand, provided that political stability returns, gets into the top 30 at 27. By 2023, India and Brazil are on the march. India is up to fourth, Brazil to fifth. Taiwan, which we're meant to call Taiwan province of China, where we're being politically correct, uh, breaks into the top 20 at 19th. And by 2028, which is a long way ahead by then, the league table is being reordered. China by then, and only then on our forecast, gets up to number one, India to number three, Mexico is in the top ten at number nine, Korea and Turkey, 11th, 12th, and have overtaken France, so the poor French president will be getting tired by then. 
And the symbols of the new world order, Nigeria, Egypt, Iraq possibly, if they stop killing each other, and the Philippines break into the top 30. All the latter group depend on maintaining, or in some cases regaining, political stability. What about UK? Well, on the face of it, we appear to be holding our position rather well. I believe that George Osborne described the World Economic League table forecast that Britain would overtake Germany by 2030 as his best Christmas present, uh, which suggests he may be in the doghouse with his wife or something. Um, I can't think a forecast would be an amazing Christmas present in general terms. Um, But uh, it looks much better than it really is. Um, It's misleading. First of all, the UK would be unlikely to overtake Germany if Germany had its own exchange rate rather than be held back by the euro. Second, the UK forecast assumes that the UK continues to have the same countries in it, um, covering England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. And that's not a done deal. The Scots have a referendum on September the 18th. Thirdly, it assumes that the UK stays in the EU. Although I believe you can make a very good economic case, I'm going to cover Europe and the euro uh, in my next lecture, but although I believe you can make a good economic case for leaving the EU in the longer term, I think that anyone who thinks you can get out without it having a huge short-term cost and probably a need to weaken the currency to offset that, um, I think, frankly, is fine in the face of economics, the short-term costs will be very significant, even if you think the long-term benefits are advantageous. So all these things are built into the assumption, and any one of them could be proved untrue, in which case the UK would not overtake Germany. So, uh, yeah, maybe George Osborne's next year's Christmas present won't be quite so so, so much fun. Um, Moreover, if you graph the UK share of world GDP using our numbers, um, you can see that we're gradually becoming a smaller proportion of the world economy. In 1998, we were just under 5% of the world economy. By 2028, we're forecast to be roughly half that share. And our estimate for 2050 is 1.5%. So we are gradually shriveling into comparative economic insignificance as a share of the total world. So we should not pat ourselves too much on the back for the forecast of becoming the largest economy in Western Europe. It's more like winning the Football Conference League than winning the Premiership, if that's what it's now called. The Sherpa Van League, possibly. Right. Let me come on to world trade. World trade today is about $20 trillion, which is about 27% of world GDP. That's an amazing number. That's more than double what it was in the 1960s, for example. More than three quarters are trade in goods, although trade in services is fast growing. Of the trade in goods, the biggest proportion by far is manufacturers with agriculture and minerals, etc., 23%, and agricultural products, 9%. But the fastest growing areas are minerals and energy, which is growing at 16%, and then um, agricultural products and services growing at 9%, and manufacturers only growing at 7%. Partly that's a relative price effect, uh, as well as a volume effect. In terms of the geography... Um, you've got two things. One is the increasing importance of trade in minerals and energy, which have to come from where they are. Uh, It's where they happen to be extracted. And quite often these turn out to be not the places where they're going to be consumed. So that adds to distances. Um, And secondly, the emergence of the fast-growing economies in the East and trade between East and West And the combination of those things has meant that the tonne kilometres for trades and goods are growing 2 to 3% per annum faster than the tonnes of goods. So the longer shipping routes, the sort of shipping miles, are making trade go further. Now, this might change a bit if we get enough global warming 
to melt the Northwest Passage. But so far, the polar ice caps, the, the, the North Pole has melted, the South, the South Pole hasn't really. Um, uh, and, but this year, actually, the North Pole has got bigger than usual again. Um, so we're not quite sure, but you know, keep on polluting and see if we can get global warming to, to work a bit harder. Uh, we might yet get a Northwest Passage uh, working. Um, there are limitations, though, because Cape-sized vessels, which are the big ones, can't get through. So I'm sorry that the melting of the ice cap seems not to have gone in line with predictions. Al Gore, who produced the film An Inconvenient Truth, said that by 2014, both ice caps would have melted. Um, so I think he perhaps should change retrospectively the title of his film to An Inconvenient Lie. Um, certainly the forecast were not brilliant, even worse than the foreign exchange forecast. Um, what is interesting, and this is really why navies are interested in what I've got to say about all this, is that many of the sea routes of increased importance are in historically dangerous waters, not just off Somalia, but also off West Africa now, um, in the Straits of Malacca, which is where I was brought up, and the Straits of Hormuz. So that makes trade sort of interesting and different in terms of its shape. And obviously, with increased specialisation, the ratio of trade to GDP continues to rise as it has been. And one of the ways this is reflected is in a study carried out by the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, BIS, which is what used to be called the DTI, and what it's calling itself this month. Um, it issues regularly a booklet, which it calls a competitiveness indicator, and allegedly shows the UK openness to trade. And their booklet, which hardly seems worth the value of the paper that they printed on, um, their booklet adds exports and imports together and expresses the sum as a share of GDP, which doesn't seem like the most intellectual of occupations, but I suppose you have to keep civil servants busy somehow. Um, anyway, what it shows is that the openness to trade for the UK has risen from 53% in 2004 to 65% in 2012. And that very much reflects uh, some of the trends that I'm discussing. Um, we've still, however, got a balance of payments current account deficit of about 60 billion. So if exports matched imports as a share of GDP, our openness to trade on this index would have to be 68%, not 65%. So, and given the ba discussion we've just had before, saying the balance of payments must balance, there'll have to be further adjustment to close that gap. The Department for Energy and Climate Change, they really are some mouthfuls, these government offices, um, have carried out, I mean, the general rule is the longer the name, the less sensible the organisation. I hope you realise that. Uh, have carried out a study looking at the economic implications of further terms of trade deterioration. They got one of the rival firms of economic consultants, someone called Oxford Economics, um, to... Uh, uh, to do this study, and what it shows is that the share of exports at constant prices uh, rises from 31.4% to 50% uh, by 2050. Now, given that it's by some rival economic consultants, I wouldn't necessarily give it too much credence. However, our own work actually corroborates uh, 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 the numbers. This is a slightly different measure because it takes account of the changes in the terms of trade. In other words, I'm measuring it at current prices, not constant prices. And that shows that 50% is reached in 2037 and 60% by 2050. Obviously, these long-term forecasts are subject to pretty decent size margins of error. So to pay for the increased cost of exports, plus the extra imports that will be attracted in by international specialisation, and to pay for the cost of the declining terms of trade, what this is saying is the UK will roughly have to double its exports to a share of GDP over roughly 40 years. Now, this is a pretty daunting task. Um, I think Harold Wilson, I seem to be going back to the past in many ways of this, uh, coined the phrase export or die. Well, I think in the 21st century, that will come back in spades. It is doable, but you do need to focus all policy very heavily on international competitiveness. It becomes absolutely key. 
as you become relatively a smaller economy, um, the international side relatively automatically becomes bigger. And it's in a sense no surprise that as our share of world GDP roughly halves, our share of our exports as a share of our GDP roughly doubles. It's not a coincidence that the two factors, they're both a factor of two, or one's a, one's a factor of one divided by two, the other's a factor of two. Now, this does affect the shape of the economy. And to do this, what I've done is used a sort of an economic construct, uh, which is called the supply and use tables. Now, the supply of goods is the left-hand column of each set of pairs of columns. There are two columns here. The columns on the left are for 2012, and the columns on the right are for 2050. The, columns, the first column on the left is the supply of goods, which is GDP plus imports. And the column on the right is the use of goods, which is, and I see the bits have slipped off the, the edge of the graph, but I'll talk you through them. The top line is exports. The second line, the red one, is investment. The dark grey is government spending. And the light grey, that's the colour it's turned out of there, yes, it has roughly, um, is, uh, is consumption. Now, our projection for 2050 is that with increased imports, GDP is still going to be 100%. Imports are going to rise from 34% to 60%. Exports have to equal imports, so they'll have to be roughly 60%. We'll need more investment, roughly. Uh, I'm assuming government spending at about the same level. This is government spending on goods and services. It doesn't include transfers, so it doesn't include things like benefits and so on, which are where the biggest cuts are likely to be. Um, what that leaves left for consumption is that consumption share, which is currently 65%, will drop to 55%. Um, now, you've all heard about the squeeze in living standards. Well, this is roughly making the same point, that living standards are likely to have to be squeezed again. Um, worth bearing in mind, this means only a quarter percent per annum slower growth in consumers' expenditure than in GDP, because it's a very long period. So it's only a quarter percent each year, but it has to be a persistent quarter percent. Um, it's a slightly bigger gap. It's about half a percent a year between the volume growth in consumer spending and the volume growth in GDP, because it's likely that the price of consumer spending will rise faster than the price of GDP for various reasons. Um, it's more a shock comparing us with the past, because the UK economy has traditionally been based on consumption and housing, and even the current economic recovery started with quite a heavy bias towards that, although a less heavy bias than has been traditionally the case. And as an economy that has relied so much on consumption and housing, we're going to have to get to grips with relying rather less on that. Um, so that's the story in terms of the shape and the changing shape of the UK economy. So we seem to have got to the end rather more quickly than usual, which is great news because there's plenty of time for questions. Um, let me just reprise the implications again. Globalisation has profound effects on the structure of our economy. Traditionally, the UK has had a strong consumer focus, and this is going to shift. They're not transforming completely. <coughs> But the importance of exports has to change dramatically. In cash terms over the next 40 years, exports have to double as a share of GDP. And the exchange rate will have to adjust to help make this happen, which is why I don't actually see any future of the UK that doesn't involve a devalued currency in real terms. I'm pretty certain that that will be one of the adjustments we have to make. At the same time, economic policy will need to be highly focused on ensuring the UK's international trading success. I said in my City AM column yesterday that uh, I'm not sure how much impact the minimum wage has on international trade, because most of the businesses involved directly in international trade pay way, well over the minimum wage. But if the careful studies show that there are serious knock-on effects, then it's quite important that that is taken into account when decisions are made on the policy. 
Uh, politicians are always tempted to go for easy votes by increasing people's living standards and telling companies that they pay. But if it damages the country's trading performance, then it's something they need to look at extremely carefully uh, as part of the mix of decisions that they make. Now, let me just describe how the other lectures in this series go. There are two more of the main series. Uh, the one on Wednesday the 12th uh, is on the euro and the impact of globalisation on it. And I'm going to discuss the thesis that it's not the intrinsic weakness of the euro that uh, has made life so difficult, although it's played its part. Um, but what's made life particularly difficult for the euro has been the fact that the biggest ever international economic change has happened just after it's got through, and the combination has proved virtually fatal. It hasn't quite killed it, uh, but it's meant that it's caused massive disruption. And the last lecture of this series on the 19th of March is going to be on how much public spending we can afford. I'd assumed in the calculations here that public spending on goods and services would have to remain uh, roughly the same as today. Um, to some extent, you can cushion the blow on consumer spending if you constrain public spending more. And that, again, is a political choice that has to be made. And I'll discuss some of the implications and some of the issues of that and you know, the overall balance of economic policy on the 19th of March. And then on the 30th of April, we'll take the two really important issues, which is the relevance of economic performance to Ash's success and whether you can have democracy in a country that doesn't play cricket. Uh, these are both terribly important subjects, which I hope will keep you ent entertained up until the end of the series. So thank you very much for turning up. Um, I will now take questions. Thank you very much indeed. Right, who's going to ask the first question? Sir. You should welcome it because uh, you are going to find that uh, uh, you become one of the most important people in the country. And uh, you will find that ultimately the policy will end up having to be designed to suit you. Uh, there are bits you should be a bit afraid of because at the moment um, the range of competitors has some limit. Um, it depends what you make or what you sell. But increasingly you will find competition from all around the world. So... That will make you have to work harder. But compared with other people in the UK, the future is going to be better for you because you're going to become one of our most prized citizens. In fact, you should be today. Next question. Guy with glasses. Sorry, that's not terribly unique. I meant the guy with glasses with, with his hand up. Um, you've, um, you've explained quite well what's going to happen and um, what the UK will have to do if it's to remain competitive. What do you think the odds are of the politicians doing what needs to be done? Um, what, do I think the politicians will be sensible? In and, a nutshell, yes. And what are the odds on the politicians being sensible? Um, I think what you tend to find is first time round, they try very hard not to. Being sensible is generally the last option. Um, but I think the economic pressures in this case are so huge that it would be quite hard for them ultimately to resist it because the alternatives for them are even tougher. I mean, take this issue of the minimum wage. I actually think they will put it up a bit, but I actually don't think they'll put it up as much as, they, uh, 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 as some of them would like in the pre-election period, because I think what they'll do is they'll look through the knock-on effects, not the direct effects, because the direct effects are more likely to be an increase in unemployment than uh, much damage to international competitiveness, but they'll look at the knock-on effects on things like uh, 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 competitiveness and conclude that they dare not. Uh, it's quite interesting, and I think the coalition has slightly encouraged this, that things like official opinion and expert opinion seem to carry quite a lot of weight at the moment. And my guess is the next government will probably be a coalition as well. Uh, it looks to me more than 60% likely, just looking at the uh, electoral arithmetic. Um, when you've got a range of parties in government, the sort of weight of the expert opinion tends to be quite a lot higher in resolving disputes between the different parties in the coalition. So I, 
I think there's a reasonable chance that they will be at least 60% sensible, but they'll pr probably try every other option first. Next question. Yes, sir. Hey, well, yeah, so I need to hear yeah. you. Real rise in the Can price you the, yeah. of primary products. Sorry, start again. Yeah, and talking about the second implication, the yeah. real rise in the price of primary products. Yeah. Do you have that same ratio, three to five times, if you were to take out oil? Because the oil price was very, very low in the mid-1990s relative to where it is today. And the second thing is that in the mid-1990s, the dollar was very, very high mm. relative to where it is today. So there's a two reasons why that ratio increased that may not be sustaining. That's a fair point, that uh, if you measure these things in dollars, you should look at the value of a dollar. And uh, I must admit I measured it in sterling. So, so I measured it in dollars. So uh, that, that, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I put a range on it, three to five. Um, minerals, the answer is yes. Things like foodstuffs, they're not up so much. The, IMF Commodities Index, which is slightly overweighted towards softs and foodstuffs, is 170 at the moment. So that's just double, or a bit less, a bit less than doubled. Um, but that is based on a base, I think I'm right in saying from 1990. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that gives a bit of an impression of how these things change. Um, let me just reprise what the second lecture said. It said... Um, Food, probably in the long term, the combination of genetically modified, which is happening in huge quantities in areas like Brazil and the United States, even if it's not in Europe, plus the, there is sufficient ability to um, irrigate more land at the moment, would probably mean that uh, the real price of food won't go up hugely. Um, soft commodities, much the same. Oil, the price is probably... I mean, our latest forecast is the first forecast I have ever done, which shows the price of oil going down slightly. It only looks like five years. Um, so that probably holds and then comes off a, a slightly artificial peak, as it were. Uh, but the price of minerals was the thing that we reckoned um, was most likely to go up. Because whereas with oil, first of all, there are various methods of alleviating the increase in demand. First of all, you put the price up you change consumption patterns. I mean, you notice if you go to Beijing, everyone turns their car engine off at traffic lights. It's not the cars have got automatic stop-start technology. It's just that they can afford the car, but they can't afford the petrol. Um, so you're finding conservation is being forced upon people by high prices. By the way, uh, when I was there in, in March, uh, the price has just gone up to 120 in sterling terms a litre. Now, if you're on a Chinese salary, that bites. Um, there's conservation, there's development of renewables, which, although they've been very heavily subsidised, they're certainly becoming very much more relatively important now. Um, and the third is the impact on supply. Um, the Americans now have four times their norm of ordinary drilling rigs. I'm not talking about shale gas here, just people sticking drilling rigs in the ground. Uh, because uh, at the current price of energy, a hell of a lot is economic. So you get those effects, and the sustained high prices are effectively generating that. Minerals is different. Um, the real problem is the standoff between the host governments and the mineral companies. Um, the mineral companies would be prepared to vet, uh, invest if they had certainty about taxation. But uh, they don't have certainty about taxation because they don't have that. Even countries like Australia suddenly try to impose mining Super taxes, the thing that caused Kevin Rudd to be thrown out the first time. Um, and so if even people who you think of as you know, fairly predictable and who indeed play cricket, uh, so you think they ought to be sensible, um, if even they'll suddenly impose mining super taxes at an unsustainable level, um, the real problem for investors is you've put the money in before they change the tax. And so uh, they don't like it if you massively change the economics. Welcome. You're just in time for the questions. Um, they don't like it if you change the economics um, after you've sunk the investment. And so as a result, there's an investment standoff. And I suspect it's mineral prices that are going to rise fastest and where we could end up with prices you know, between 10 and 15 times what they were uh, in uh, the historic periods of the 1980s and 1990s. Sorry, to be, oh, sorry, the other one, water. The price of water will go up as well. So... 
He's offering you first. Okay, right. Thank Beauty you. before age, or vice versa, maybe. <laughs> I think I'm old. Um, just going back to the 1970s, 80s, whenever I went to Department of Trade and Industries, it was then for help on whatever it was, nearly the first question you were given was, what is the balance of trade for your sector? Is it positive? I don't know why. It may have been North Sea Oil, but you move on to the late 80s, 90s, nobody seemed to bother about the balance of trade. We could spend money, we built up social services, the country got into debt. Now, I can't get into debt just spending money I haven't got. So, is the future that we've got to get a balance of trade positive every year and not to use any benefits from shale gas in subsidising more social expenditure? Um, you mix, there are lots of different things mixed into there, but let me concentrate on one point, which is the balance of payments. First of all, a lot of what I'm saying is we're going back to the 70s. Um, and you're right to point out North Sea Oil, which temporarily removed the balance or weakened the balance of payments constraint, but two other things happened. We also had floating exchange rates, which meant that people didn't get so worried about the balance of payments because you could make a small exchange rate adjustment to compensate. And the other thing that happened at the same time was world capital flows. Cross-border capital flows became huge. Um, There's something like, if you use the spot market, is about 50 times current accounts. And if you include the derivatives, it's so many hundred times, I don't know the number, but it's very, very big and you know, massive multiples. And given that, you can finance small current account deficits. But I did argue that I can't see why an investor would put their money into financing a, a persistent current account deficit country, because you know that eventually it must go belly up in the sense that the exchange rate must fall. And if you get your timing wrong, you're going to lose an absolute shed load of money when the currency drops, which is more than any marginal interest rate turn that you make on the, on the hedge. So my guess is that uh, uh, the balance of payments will come back into fashion, and people like you and me will be talking the truth once for once. Um, so that's good news. It was actually Goodness. Well, maybe someone read my article in City AM yesterday. It's just possible. David Smith, who is a great economics correspondent, has got an article in the Sunday Times. It will either be next week or I think more likely the week after uh, on the same subject. We've had quite a long discussion on this and he's already seen a copy of this lecture. So you might find that uh, you got there first and it's in the Sunday Times two weeks after you fell in. Now, you had a question, sir, and you were very generous and you let the you. gentleman next to you go ahead. Um, and then I'll take questions from the back. And we've got plenty of time for decent questions this time, so it should be good. Well, if you'll accommodate me, can I ask two questions? Ah. <laughs> as the long f- as they're both short. OK. Well, the first or more one, precisely, as long as the answers are short. The first one is about business services. I understand business services uh, contribute about 20% of the overall export total. So where do you see that going? Yeah. And if you were to invest your pension fund speculatively in an export growth business, what business would that be? Okay. Um, I'm going to take the first one and answer at reasonable length. I'm going to give a fairly flippant answer to the second one I've read uh, because I'm not licensed to give investment advice. And uh, if I gave you bad advice, you might have some uh, apparent ability to sue me. And since I don't like getting sued, uh, I I will limit what I say. Um, Services are 23% of world export, world trade. But for the UK, uh, there are 36%. So we are one of, I think, we're the world's second biggest exporter of services. And they are very important to the UK. So their contribution is relatively more important for us than it is for other countries. If we don't have success in exporting um, services, and the biggest exports are business services, but they include all sorts of things, so media, films, royalties from books, all sorts of things like that, where the UK seem to have a particular talent. Um, uh, all of those things become important and become increasingly important. And by the way, the profitability... If you think how much we're going to have to devalue in real terms to get to exports being 60% of GDP, you can see exporting is going to become hugely profitable relative to supplying the home market. So although there will be increased international competition, 
Um, you know, one of our great advantages is the English language, which uh, is the international language, not so much through our fault, but because it's the language they speak in America. Um, but uh, that is a huge advantage to us. And it's one of the... I mean, we'll have to play every card we've got, but it's one that we'll have to play quite hard. Where should you invest your pension? Well, um, the temptation, if you assume that the currency is going to devalue, is to invest overseas. You do have to find people who won't cheat you and knit your money. Uh, so that gets a bit more complex, because while we can roughly rely on the rule of law for UK pension providers, uh, there are other things which are a bit more complex. Um, so I think uh, the other point I would make is don't think you're going to be able to retire early and live off your gains, whether ill-gotten or otherwise. Um, I think for most of us, uh, the yields on all investments are going to have to be, are going to be fairly low kept low by the Chinese savings club, which looks likely to persist, roughly speaking. And because of that, you're not going to get big yields. And without big yields, you're not going to be able to live off the interest on the interest, or let alone the interest, interest alone. So you'll have to retire at the sort of age where you can expect to draw down capital. So uh, work out your life expectancy and then do the maths. <laughs> Next question. Now, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be a bit sexually discriminatory about this. Is there a lady who wants to ask a question, right? Because I've been only taking questions from men. I know men tend to be a bit more forceful about sticking out their hands and things like that, but I think it's unfair. I just wanted to ask, why does it matter where we are in relation to other countries? Is it just because we're competing with others for um, a share of the export market, or is there, are there other things? Well, that's a very sensible question, then. Why does it matter? It's something it doesn't. I mean, it's just, um, you know, it's a, it's a way of graphically demonstrating things. What does matter is what generates the position there. Because if you're doing badly in the league table, you're either having collapsing currency, which may be sensible, but it may be more a reflection of you doing, having bad policies, or you've got slow growth. Um, one or the other is likely not to be a good thing because it has its uh, wash back into living standards and so on. But fundamentally, it doesn't matter. It's just a neat way of demonstrating who's running their policies relatively well and who isn't. And for some reason, governments get amazingly excited about it. I mean, I, you know, I, I've just given a huge warning, a huge health warning on the fact that the UK may overtake Germany, which I say is like winning the... the uh, uh, the FA, was it the Conference League or the Sherpa Van League or whatever it calls itself this week? It's a bit like DTI, it changed its name every week. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not really big news because uh, by then the best team in Europe, so to speak, will be a long way short of the best team in the world. So it doesn't matter hugely. It's more what figures lie behind it. Next question. Sir. And then there was a hand. Okay. So I'm going to go to the lady in gender discrimination um, before the you, man. You mentioned almost in passing the presumption that the UK going forward will consist of what it presently consists of. Um, I just wonder whether there is much potential effect in the idea of Scotland leaving. I mean, I've never seen anybody playing cricket in kilts. <laughs> and at the same time, I understand, but I stand to be corrected, that if they do leave the, Europe, uh, the UK, they will, at de facto, be outside the European Union. Does that make much difference? The UK, then, is slightly smaller. Uh, they would have to reapply for the European Union. Would it affect our inclination to drop out of the European Union, etc.? Well, it's a very nice question for you to ask me. As a Scot who lives in England and who is therefore disenfranchised in this referendum and feels quite strongly about it. Um, but I think it's really not a question I've got the time to answer. So I'm just going to give... I'm just going to ra I've, you've raised a lot of the key points yourself and they're questions to which I don't think I have the answer any more than anyone else. But I do think that... Um, Sort of people in England. I was at an Anglo-Spanish conference in uh, uh, November this year, where they had the great and the good from both countries. Plus me, I managed to inveigle my way in, with, despite not being either great or good. Uh, but um, the Spaniards thought we were absolutely mad 
to treat uh, the potential loss of Scotland uh, with relative equanimity. Uh, and we said to them, well, you know, it historically has been a different country, and so there is a reason for that. But they have treated Catalan uh, separation as something of primary concern to the Spanish state, and the government has forbidden them from holding a referendum, and it is able to enforce that. Now, I do think the Spaniards have a point, which is that we, living in England, have a sort of view it's a matter for the Scots. I actually think it's a matter for the UK as a whole, because we'll be a very different country if Scotland leaves. And I really do, do think that most people in England haven't really focused on it. And ha internationally, we'll be looked at as a, you know, someone who is sort of declining. I know that in some sense that doesn't matter. Uh, GDP per capita may be as high, it may even be higher if subsidies no longer have to be paid, etc. But it will look at as a sort of place that people want to leave. Whereas the Im image at the moment, I don't know what your views are on immigration, but the image of the UK at the moment is, the place, uh, is an image that people, place that people want to come to. Uh, so it must have something going for it. Um, and I think if people start voting to leave, it will rather reverse that image. Now, that's just one factor. Um, I really don't know the answer to all the questions that you, you asked, and so I won't go down the list of them saying I don't know. But uh, they are all important issues, and they're issues that deserve a lot more discussion than we've actually had in the UK. Right, lady over there, and then gentleman in front. Um, if, as you say, we have to... Um double our exports as a percentage of GDP, then presumably we need to start thinking now about the implications for education uh, so that we have the right people to do it. Um, I guess there are the obvious things, languages, but I wonder what you think we need to be focusing on now in the education system so that people are ready, the types of things that, um, so that we're able to be really good at what we're good at in order to be able to compete. <coughs> That's a very interesting question, and you know, starting right where, it, where it's most effective, which is uh, in terms of education. You're right to mention languages, and not just the more traditional foreign languages, which may help us on our ski holidays, but the languages that are likely to help in those places where we're uh, going to be exporting. Um, and some of them are, of course, historically a lot more difficult than uh, languages that have a common root from English. Um, I think the second thing is sort of focus on two aspects. Um, if I had strayed into a third year, I probably would have picked up some of these issues, but uh, uh, they're not quite as sexy as the issues I've managed to cover in the, the first two years, so they probably wouldn't justify 200 people turning up. Um, but I would have argued that things like, uh, obviously, technological superiority, and I guess the Electronics is still, and uses of electronics and software are things that are, are very much, very sexy at the moment. Biotechnology will, I think, over the next 40 years, really come on big. Um, but I think we often forget the vital importance of creativity. Now, I think that our educational system, for all its weaknesses, is quite good at fostering creativity. Partly, we encourage people slightly too much to do their own thing, which has all sorts of interesting social consequences. But one of the positive effects of it is that people are quite creative in the UK. And, you know, at all sorts of levels, from producing music, uh, it's extraordinary how many, what high proportion of American hits are by British artists, for example, um, through to the arts and so on. And as creativity becomes a bigger element, you know, IT massively expands the sort of field in which creativity can be applied. I have a feeling that that will be somewhere where uh, some of the weakness of our educational system may turn out to be an advantage to the extent that they cover. Uh, 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 I think the British are pretty creative, and I think we will actually find that creativity goes a long way. Um, I think it's the one thing that the more regimented uh, educational regimes in the East will find extremely difficult to replicate, because... I think if you live in a dictatorship where what you're even allowed to think, let alone what you're allowed to say, is fairly limited. I mean, just think of the way that the Chinese government got quite aggressive about Ai Weiwei. 
I don't see him as a great artist. Uh, in fact, I think he's a pretty lousy artist. But, uh, uh, so in that sense, I agree with the Chinese government, but only from the point of view of uh, critical perspective. I think the way they detained him was outrageous. And um, that kind of thing um, is... Uh, it, it, it's an indication of how free-thinking and creativity in the emerging economies is much less encouraged than it is in the UK. And I think as we sort of move to having a new area of specialisation, I think that's likely to be one of the most important. And it's one of the great contributors. Films and records and things like that are one of the great contributors to our exports of services. And because individually they don't amount to very much, people very rarely aggregate them together and realise quite how important they are. So I think that's probably the bit that people often don't notice, but will become of increasing commercial importance. Person in front of you. And then, sorry, one more question. And since you've been putting your hand up consistently, sir, uh, I think it's about time you... The last question gave me a perfect introduction to what I want to say, because everybody agrees that we have got to become much more based on exports. Having said that, we have a, a, a great tradition of being inventors, and we will go on doing that, thanks to our education system, which is imperfect, but it does a pretty good job. Um, the real problem we have in this country is turning our inventions into products and then going out and marketing them. And we develop a lot of things and other countries take them and, uh, and fly with them. Unless we can focus on transforming inventions, brilliant inventions, into marketable products where we've got a gap to fill. Well, Ronnie, you had a, a great career at IBM a very distinguished career at IBM, so you'll know one of the most successful companies at turning inventions into successful products, so you'll understand exactly what you're talking about. I think you're right. I think what's changed today a bit from so 20 or 30 years ago is that much more the people who make, who, t who, who, who do the thing, uh, who, 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 who invent things, actually sell it themselves. Uh, businesses descaled massively in the last 30 years. Partly, it's technology that's made it possible. Now, I would agree with you completely. Where is the British Google? Where is the uh, British Apple? Where is the British Microsoft? The interesting thing is they're all in the United States. They're not in China. Um, but uh, that is something we need to learn to get good at. And we need to learn to think in, uh, in global terms. Interestingly, Amazon uh, was... Uh, founded by Jeff Bethos, who is Spanish, uh, but Spanish-American. Spanish but he went to America to make his invention work. And, of course, Amazon is now very much an American company. But it is founded by a European, not by an American, or someone with more European than American. So quite interesting in that context. Um, but you're right, we, go, we are going to need to get much better at marketing our products. And, I mean, the whole point about technology is that success massively is based on scale. I mean, Amazon, they're not perfect at what they do, but they've got such scale that they get massive economies of scale. And technology is the kind we get at the moment, which is very heavily information-based. Technology massively great, uh, 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 creates what I call super economies of scale, which mean that if you get big, you can dominate the market. So the point you're making, Ronnie, is... a is a very good one. Thank you. Just over there. And then I think I get kicked out. Valerie is trying to make me not take this question, but I will take it if you don't mind. You let me do, this, do so? Okay, one question. So it's, uh, it's about exports um, and your thoughts on what, uh, what are the elements that, uh, that Britain needs to achieve or that needs to do all the things that would come together to actually increase our exports. Um, and you've answered this in several contexts already, so there's been... Uh, education and uh, innovation and actually bringing things to market as opposed to just making the invention and then other people. But So, yeah, what are your thoughts, and maybe in the context, to keep it short, of uh, the European Union and how that might limit us in the sense that we used to trade with uh, the Commonwealth before we joined the EU in 1973? 
uh, or whether it's not a limitation but it might actually help us. And then things like devaluation of the currency due to printing currency, which we're doing quite a lot of at the moment, and uh, the movement of precious metals to the east. Um, Therefore, even debasing our currency I'm going, I'm going to give you a, 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 a portfolio answer that covers the whole <laughs> lot. The first thing is, it's such a big issue. We're going to have to do everything. It's not either or. We're going to have to do most things and pull all the levers. Um, the second is EU. I can't see us not trading with our other European uh, 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 colleagues. Whether we're in or out, there'll be a free trade deal of some kind. Uh, but obviously, uh, we will have to trade much more with the emerging markets because that's where the spending power is going to be. Um, otherwise, it's just a matter of pulling every single lever you can think of. Uh, it's not just a single thing. Thank you all very much for coming. And thank you for such interesting questions. So it's been fascinating. We've got through 20 minutes that seemed like no time as, we, as we've gone through them. So thank you very much for that. As usual... <laughs>